Welcome to our next Wondering Walks of Wonder adventure. Today we're headed to the Stafford Air and Space Museum in Weatherford, Oklahoma. This museum is named for NASA astronaut and Weatherford native Thomas P. Stafford. The museum features exhibits about aviation, space exploration, rocketry, and a collection of over 20 historic aircraft. As we go through the museum, we'll also include exhibits and see Stafford's Apollo 10 spacecraft, his spacesuit, the Gemini 6A spacecraft, artifacts from the space program, the Hubble Space Telescope, the Mir Station, a moon rock, a Titan II missile, and a Mark VI reentry vehicle. The museum is named for legendary astronaut and flight pioneer Lieutenant General Thomas B. Stafford. Stafford was a native of Weatherford and one of only 24 people to have traveled to the moon. He graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy and is a recipient of the Cong Congressional Space Medal of Honor. He's a veteran of four space flights. He piloted the Gemini 6A and commanded Gemini 9A, the 1969 moon orbiting mission Apollo 10, and the 1975 Apollo Soyuz test project. One of the first artifacts we see is this lunar sample or a moon rock. Inside this acrylic uh, encapsulation is a small fragment of an actual moon rock gathered by the Apollo 17 astronauts. We also see Lieutenant General Stafford's Space Medal of Honor. This is the highest civilian honor presented by the United States to astronauts that have distinguished themselves to the heights of order. In 1993, through authorization by the U.S. Congress, President George H.W. Bush presented General Stafford this Medal of Honor for feats of extraordinary accomplishment, for service to the United States, and to mankind. Thank you. 
One of the first aircrafts we see as we head into the museum is the Wright Flyer. On December 17, 1903, the Wright brothers achieved the first successful flight of a heavier-than-air engine-powered aircraft. They did this at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. This is one of just a few flyable replicas of that aircraft. We're heading towards a really special exhibit here. This, these are the holy grail of aerospace artifacts. This piece of fabric that we see, as well as a propeller fragment, are pieces from the original 1903 Wright Flyer that flew to the moon with Neil Armstrong on the historic Apollo 11 mission. Neil Armstrong carried these significant pieces in his personal preference kit, or PPK. Each astronaut was given a PPK to carry mementos on their missions, and it was fitting that the first man to walk on the moon carry these special pieces from the first successful powered flight. This aircraft that we're seeing now is the Blairio 9. This is the first aircraft to cross the English Channel. Louis Blairio's feat in 1909 altered the concept that island nations like England could only be invaded from the seas. This was proven out just five years later as aircraft development expanded the scope in World War I and proved that no nation was immune to attack. This aircraft that we're seeing now is a called a Curtis Pusher. It's one of the first airplanes that were actually built in quantity. It was also the aircraft type which made the first takeoff and landing from the deck of a ship. One of the most recognizable and famous airplanes here is a replica of the Spirit of St. Louis. Charles Lindbergh became one of the most famous figures of the 20th century when he became the first person to fly a solo, non-stop flight across the Atlantic in his custom-built Ryan NYP aircraft. 
It was named for his financial backers from St. Louis, Missouri. Ahead of us is a V-2 rocket engine. This is one of the only remaining actual V-2 rocket engines left in existence in the world. Developed by Nazi Germany during World War II, the V-2 is considered as one of the greatest leaps forward in rocket, in rocket technology and is considered the world's first operational ballistic missile. Captured by the U.S. at the end of the war, the V-2 technology established the foundation for America's space program and its future journey to landing a man on the moon in 1969. Ahead of us, is, we're moving into the rocket area, and this is the Goddard rocket. An American, Dr. Robert Goddard, developed and launched the first successful liquid-fueled rocket in 1926. His invention would open the door to make spaceflight possible. As we walk around this exhibit, we're also going to see several rockets of the world, showcasing all of the man-made man-made rockets of the space race and many of the current satellite boosters used by the world's nations. Each of these models in this rare collection are all the same 172nd scale to show relative size comparisons.
This is one of the actual control consoles from the historic Mission Control at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. This console was used from the early Gemini missions in 1965 through the Apollo moon landings, Skylab, Apollo Soyuz, and the early shuttle programs. More than 20 graduates of Southwestern Oklahoma State University located here in Weatherford worked in mission control during these early space missions. We're now taking a look at a Gemini spacecraft. This is a complete Gemini spacecraft as it would have appeared in Earth orbit. At the end of their space mission and just before the two-man crew started their fiery re-entry back through the atmosphere, the two large white colored equipment modules on the back of the craft were blown off to expose the rear heat shield and the front half of the nose was jettisoned to allow the parachutes to come out. One of the more historic artifacts here that we see at the Stafford Space Museum is this Gemini 6A spacecraft. This is the actual flown Gemini 6 spacecraft flown by astronauts Tom Stafford and Wally Shirera when they performed the very first rendezvous in space with spacecraft Gemini 7 on December 15, 1965. The mission accomplished by this spacecraft is considered as one of the most significant events in manned space history, for without a rendezvous, a future lunar landing would have been impossible. Ahead of us in this case is an astronaut maneuvering unit. This is the actual flight backup unit of the astronaut maneuvering unit, or the AMU, that was to be worn by spacewalking astronaut Gene Cernan during the Gemini mission in 1966. The commander of the mission, Tom Stafford, had to cut Cernan's EVA short because of major problems encountered by Cernan that nearly cost him his life. The original AMU was not returned to Earth. This cone-shaped artifact that we see in front of us is a Mark VI nuclear warhead. This is an actual deactivated Mark VI warhead of the type that tripped the Titan II ICBM rocket as seen to your right. This warhead contained one of the largest thermonuclear warheads ever built by the U.S. Its yield was equivalent to more than 600 times the explosive power the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima, Hiroshima Japan. This large rocket that we see in front of us is a Titan II rocket. The Titan II rocket served two important purposes for the United States. It was originally developed by the Air Force as an intercontinental ballistic missile with the capability of carrying large nuclear warheads. NASA then determined that it would be the perfect booster to launch their Gemini manned spacecraft. Tom Stafford rode two of these rockets into space aboard his Gemini 6 and 9 missions in 1965 and 1966. This is Tom Stafford's actual Gemini spacesuit used during the preparation for his Gemini 6 and, and Gemini 9 space missions.
Ahead of us is an F-1 rocket engine. The F-1 is the largest and most powerful rocket engine ever built. Five of these powered the giant Saturn V moon rocket. On liftoff, these engines generated more than 176 million horsepower, and each engine burned a swimming pool of amount of fuel each second. Ahead of us is a piece of what's called a crawler shoe. The space shuttle, Saturn V, and IB rockets were carried three miles to their launch pads aboard a giant crawler. This is one of the actual links out of one of the crawler's motorized th treads and indicate how huge the rockets and crawler were. Each of these shoes weighs exactly one ton or 2,000 pounds. This is a J-2 rocket engine. Five J-2 rocket engines powered the second stage of the Saturn V moon rocket and one powered the third stage. A single J-2 also powered the second stage of the Saturn uh, 1B rocket. The J-2 was the first, largest, and hydrogen-fueled engine and the first to be able to be restarted multiple times during flight. We've seen several American rocket engines. This is a Soviet rocket engine, a Soviet NK-33. The NK-33 rocket engine was the highest performing liquid oxygen kerosene engine ever built. It was designed to power the giant N-1 moon rocket, the Soviet competitor to the American Saturn V rocket. Our museum is the only place in the world that you can see an American F-1 engine and a Soviet NK-33 engine together on display. Only three NK-33 engines are on display in the entire world.
This is a full-scale replica of an Apollo Command and Service Module spacecraft. The Apollo CSM served as the mothership of all Apollo Skylab and Apollo Soyuz missions, including all the lunar landing flights. The astronauts rode in the conical-shaped front end of the spacecraft called the Command Module during launch and re-entry. Because it had a protective heat shield, it was the only section of the 36-story tall Saturn V launch vehicle that could return to Earth. The large cylinder section behind the command module is the service module that supplies oxygen, water, electrical power, communication, and propulsion for the spacecraft, and it's jettisoned before re-entry. We also see a display of a lunar module. The, lunar, the Apollo 11 lunar module, or Eagle, was the first crewed vehicle to land on the moon. It carried two astronauts, Commander Neil A. Armstrong and pilot Edwin E. Buzz Aldrin, Jr. These were the first men to walk on the moon. At launch, the lunar module sat directly behind the command and service module with legs folded inside the spacecraft to the LM adapter. This door that we see here is the actual flown main hatch door recovered from the Apollo 10 command module. is an actual Apollo 10 spacesuit. This is the actual flown spacesuit worn by Tom Stafford when he commanded the historic Apollo 10 mission to the moon in May 1969. Wearing this spacesuit during re-entry, Stafford and his fellow crewmates Gene Cernan and John Young set the record for the fastest speed a human had ever, human had ever achieved, 24,791 miles per hour a record that would not be broken until someone returns from a trip to Mars. We're now about ready to walk through an actual flown segment of a space shuttle solid rocket booster. This was flown into space seven times, recovered, and reconditioned for flight. Because of the extreme pressures and temperatures this unit had to endure during launch, there are no seams in this cylinder. It was machined out of a solid block of carbon steel. Ahead of us are various uh, artifacts from Tom Stafford's Apollo 10 mission. One of those items is a lunar module checklist. It's an actual flown checklist that was used by Stafford to pilot the first lunar module to the moon.
In May 1969, the flag was also flown to the moon on the Apollo 10 lunar module. Hi, Hi how are you? Oh, I am. This is the actual space shuttle fixed space simulator that was located at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston for more than 30 years during the space shuttle program. All 135 shuttle crews did their primary fixed space training in this simulator. The two sections displayed here would normally have been hooked together to form the shuttle's main flight deck or cockpit.
The Apollo-Soyuz mission in 1975 that was commanded by Tom Stafford was the first international space flight. The mission required two very dissimilar spacecraft, the American Apollo and the Russian Soyuz, to rendezvous and dock together in orbit. This required the special docking rings that we saw that were designed for both spacecraft that would fit properly together. This is the actual flight backup docking unit for the ASTP mission that would have been mated to the Soviet Soyuz spacecraft. On October 14, 1947, the experimental Bell X-1 rocket plane became the first aircraft to punch through the sound barrier, one of aviation's greatest technological obstacles. Air Force Captain Chuck Yeager piloted the historic flight and named the aircraft Glamorous Glinda in honor of his wife. This is an F-86 Sabre fighter. It's America's first swept-wing jet fighter aircraft. The North American F-86 gained fame during the Korean War as the outstanding fighter of its day. One of the many aircraft to be flown by Tom Stafford during his military career, it was also one of his most favorite to fly. The Soviet MiG-21 was the most produced jet fighter aircraft in history. It served as the frontline fighter for nearly all of the Soviet bloc countries during the Cold War. This specific fish bed was flown by General Stafford during his tenure as commander of the United States Air Force Flight Test Center Groom Lake and in Area 51. Stafford was the project test pilot for the Northrop T-38, the world's first supersonic training aircraft. So successful has been the design of the Talon that even after nearly a half century of flying, it continues to be America's primary advanced jet fighter training aircraft and has been further cleared to fly until 2030. The T-38 also has been NASA's primary supersonic training aircraft for astronauts since the early 1960s. This is a full-scale replica of the Little Boy bomb, the first nuclear weapon used in warfare. Little Boy was the code name for the type of atomic bomb dropped on the Japanese city of Hiroshima on August 6, 1945 during World War II. According to figures published in 1945, 66,000 people were killed as a direct result of the Hiroshima blast and 69,000 were injured to varying degrees. Of those deaths, 20,000 were members of the Imperial Japanese Army. At 8.15, a weather plane reports from Hiroshima that conditions are good. Two-tenths lower and middle, and two-tenths. 
cents at 15,000 feet. As they approach the target area, the weapon is checked for the last time. At 9 11, 31,000 feet over Hiroshima, the Enola Gay begins the bombing. The bomb is dropped. The aircraft banks away at high speed. Just 50 seconds later, 15 miles from ground zero, the Enola Gay is dropped. I hope you've enjoyed this tour through the Stafford Air and Space Museum in Weatherford, Oklahoma. Make sure to hit that like and subscribe button, and we'll see you on our next Walker tour. Take care now. Bye.